Amen. Good morning, Life Church. I'm glad that you're with us this morning. If we don't know one another, my name is James Sharp. I'm one of the pastors here. It's my joy to open God's Word with you this morning. We're going to be in Galatians chapter 4. So I hope you have a Bible with you. I'm going to hope you'll turn there and kind of wait for me. Galatians 4 is where I will be, and I'll meet you in just a couple of moments. Um, just like one word as we kind of get started, um, I feel great this morning. I sound like death this morning. And so um, I mentioned that to you. Like, if you just pray along with me, um, I'm cognizant of the fact that I can yell at you only so long this morning before my voice, like, just gives way altogether. And so, like, pray that the Lord would kind of sustain us all through that. Um, yeah, I, like I said, I don't, I don't feel bad at all, but um, I realize I don't sound that way. And so let's just ask the Lord to kind of be with us as we walk through this space together. Um, this morning, we are in week three of a teaching series here that we call This We Believe. Um, We are unpacking one statement at a time or one article at a time, the statement of faith that the elders here are proposing to the members of our church that we embrace as a statement that reflects our convictions as a church. This morning, we're talking about article three of that statement of faith, which outlines the nature in person and work of God the Father. Now, if you were with us last week, we were in Article 2 of our Statement of Faith, which outlines the doctrine of the Trinity. Right? The Bible reveals the fact that the God of the universe is one God, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God, the Father is not the Son, The Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father, and all that amounts to the doctrine of the Trinity. There is one God. This week, we get to drill down specifically on the nature and character and work of God the Father. Who is the Heavenly Father? What does the Heavenly Father do, especially in the work of saving and redeeming us, his people, And why, I think this is a key question, why has the triune God chosen to reveal himself as Father? That's what we're really after today. Because in truth, the, the fatherhood of God, it can be a challenging idea for us. Some of us, by God's grace, have had absolutely wonderful fathers in our lives, men marked by grace and gentleness, by compassion and conviction, right? It's easy for us to think of our heavenly father in terms and concepts that are connected to our earthly fathers. But for others of us, that just isn't the case, right? Our earthly fathers, they bring to mind brokenness and sorrow, pain and poverty, Or perhaps even worse than that, some of us don't even know our earthly fathers. And so this notion of fatherhood, like it leaves a vacuum, an empty space that communicates what we have never had and what we have never known. In light of that, why has God chosen to reveal himself to us as father? When the idea of fatherhood is so painful for so many, and even those of us who have had great fathers can acknowledge that no human father is remotely close to perfect. Why has God chosen to reveal himself in this way? Much is at stake in how we answer that question. In fact, our answer to that question, it takes us to the very heart of the gospel itself. That's what the theologian J.I. Packer said, at least. Decades ago, he wrote this. It's still true today. He said, you sum up the whole of New Testament religion if you describe it as the knowledge of God as one's holy father. If you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, it means that he does not understand Christianity very well at all. So why does our understanding of God as Father reveal the heart of the gospel? Why does it sum up, as Packer says, the whole of New Testament religion? 
It's because in understanding God as Father, we can understand what it means to be adopted into God's loving and eternal family. That is what is at stake, and that's what I hope to lay before you this morning as we look at Galatians 4, 4 through 7. Let me read our passage for us, and then we will work through these things together. The Apostle Paul, writing to churches in and around the province of Galatia, he says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Church, this is the word of the Lord for us. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Our statement of faith in describing the person and work of the Father, it emphasizes God's transcendent and sovereign rule over all of history. Like if you picked up our series guide before we ran out of them, um, this is all printed for you and you can read along with me, but let me read just a few excerpts from that proposed statement of faith. They'll be on the screen so that you can see what I mean. Article three, it says this. It says, we believe in God the Father, an infinite personal spirit who is good, righteous, and just. He is perfect in holiness, wisdom, power, and love. He reigns with providential care over his universe and infallibly foreknows all that shall come to pass according to his sovereign will. Now, what's being emphasized in those statements is God's perfection and goodness. God is a perfect father. Any good human father is merely a shadow of the perfect heavenly father. And any bad human father is really like the photo negative of the Heavenly Father, revealing the opposite of who our Heavenly Father is. Our Heavenly Father is good, He is righteous, He is just, He's perfect in holiness and wisdom and power and love. That means He's not sometimes holy. That means He's not occasionally holy. That means He's not sometimes wise or occasionally loving. It means He is all of those things all the time in perfection. In other words, it is our Heavenly Father who shows us what those things truly are. If we are to know what love is, we look to the way our Heavenly Father loves his people. If we were to know what goodness is, we look to the character and nature of our Heavenly Father. This is what the statement of faith emphasizes, but then it moves in Article 3 to emphasize God's sovereign work over time and space and history. Right, it emphasizes the fact that God reigns with providential care over the universe that he's created. It says he infallibly foreknows all that shall come to pass. That means that the Father is never surprised. He's never caught off guard. He's completely aware at every moment of every day of every single thing that is happening. He knows all things. He sees all things. Absolutely nothing is hidden from him which would be terrible, right? A holy God who sees all things and knows all things, a holy God who sees and knows every hidden desire lurking in the dark corners of our sinful hearts, that would be a terrible reality. But Article 3 continues, the Father saves all who come to him through Jesus Christ from sin and death. And it's really these two realities, the providence of God the Father by which he rules and reigns over all of history, and then the tender mercy of God the Father by which he saves sinners. Right, it's these two realities that Paul has been dealing with if you read Galatians 3 and the early part of Galatians 4. Paul's been talking about the reality that there are Old Testament saints 
who have trusted in saving faith in the promises of God before the coming of Christ. Old Testament saints who lived, he says, under the law. And then Paul uses in the beginning of Galatians 4 an illustration. He says that the people of God before the coming of Christ were like trust fund kids. Right? They lived with the promise of great riches. One day they would inherit great riches from the Father that he intended to leave for them. And legally speaking, those riches were already theirs. But experientially, they were not theirs. Until the date set by the Father when the trust fund would kick in, right, these children had nothing. They were no better than servants or even slaves in their father's house. And Paul uses that illustration to emphasize for us what has happened in the coming of Christ. He says the promise has been realized, the inheritance that the Father promised to give to his children. It's no longer just a promise, it's a reality. And it is that reality that makes the fatherhood of God so sweet and so powerful. Let's look at it a little more carefully. Just turn back to the passage with me, if you will. Keep your eyes on it. We'll start again in verse four. Paul says, but when the fullness of time had come, the Father, who reigns with providential care over his universe, he waited for the perfect moment to send his son. Historians have written much about this. They've acknowledged the fact that if Jesus Christ had been sent into the world 200 years earlier or 200 years later than the night on which he was born in that little town of Bethlehem, that the advance of Christianity would have been much slower and harder in the world. But they're acknowledging the fact that God sent Jesus when the fullness of time had come, at the very perfect moment. At the moment that Jesus came into the world, the Greek language had spread throughout the known world. So the writings of the New Testament, they could be understood by peoples all over Europe and all over Asia and all over most of Africa. The Roman Empire had built roads and then populated garrisons of soldiers all along those roads throughout the Mediterranean world. So it was safe and even expedient for missionaries like the Apostle Paul to travel with the news of the gospel all over the world. The Christ was born at the perfect time under the loving direction of the Father. Verse four goes on. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law. The son was born of woman. He was fully and truly human. The son was born under the law which he fulfilled in perfect righteousness. We will talk more about the Son next week, but what Paul's emphasizing here is that Jesus Christ, the Son, was qualified in every way to accomplish our redemption. And he was sent by the Father. Why? Well, verse five. To redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Now, in our culture, the reality of adoption, it's a wonderful thing. Like some of us have experienced it, right? A family accepting into their home as their own one who does not belong. It's powerful. The love and the acceptance that an adopted son or daughter receives almost always out of a context of pain and brokenness and emptiness, adoption is a tremendous gift in our modern society. But in ancient Rome, at the time of the New Testament, adoption was an even more staggering gift. In the Roman world, adoption, it meant receiving a whole new legal identity, an identity that transformed everything in your life. If you were adopted in ancient Rome, that means that your old relationship with your natural family came to an end. All of your previous financial debts were canceled and you were given a new legal name, the name of your adoptive family. And it was literally as if you were starting a brand new life. It was as if you were born again. 
But the practice of adoption, it was extremely rare in Rome. Just not many families did it. Only wealthy and influential families even could do it. People didn't adopt in ancient Rome out of, like, compassion or benevolence. Or they didn't adopt children because those children needed parents. They adopted children because they needed heirs. Right, and so a wealthy family that had no biological children of their own, or especially no sons of their own, they didn't have anyone to leave their inheritance to. They didn't have anyone to leave their wealth to. And so they would adopt into their family a favored servant or slave. And the second that servant or slave was adopted into their family, right, he was given the legal status of Sonship. His relationship with his natural family ended. He would take on the new family name of his adopted father, and his debts, they would be canceled. He would begin his new life with his adopted family. And eventually, he would receive the entire estate of his adoptive father. He would receive the inheritance that would have been his had he been the only son of that adopted father. In other words, an adopted son in Rome had all of the same legal rights and privileges and inheritance of the the best and brightest of Roman society, of the, the favored and privileged oldest sons of wealthy Roman families. I hope you sense the wonder that's in this, given that Paul is telling us here that we have received adoption to sonship from the Father through the Son. We were, the Bible tells us, slaves to sin. We were dead in our transgressions. We were strangers to the promises of God. We were foreigners among the people of God. We were spiritual orphans who were utterly and hopelessly lost and desolate. But the Father sent his Son born of woman, born under the law to redeem us from the law and to adopt us into his new family. He has canceled all of our debts. He has given us new life. We bear a new name, the family name of Jesus and our ties to our former life. But the penalty of sin and life under the law, these things are broken. And perhaps most astonishingly, the Father has given us freely an inheritance, the inheritance that he once reserved for his one and only son, with the favor and affection and approval in his family that once belonged to the one and only son, the place at his table that once belonged to the one and only son. The, this is what First Peter calls it, the imperishable, undefiled inheritance waiting for us in glory that is the rightful dwelling place only of the one and only Son. God has given his adopted children an inheritance. Is that not a wondrous thing to consider? If you're a Christian today, you have the full legal rights and privileges of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. His honor is your honor. His reward is your reward. His glory is your glory. His inheritance is your inheritance. And it is impossible to overstate the wonder of this. Perhaps imagine that you lived in some bygone medieval era. And imagine that in that bygone medieval era, you were summoned into the court of the king. A king who's known to be good, but a king who's known to be powerful. And imagine that you're not looking forward to entering into the king's presence because you've been an outlaw and a traitor your entire life. You've broken his laws. You've conspired against him. You've been a traitor. Or you've organized rebellions and now you're sure this good and righteous king, he's welcoming you into his presence to bring you to justice and you have no legitimate defense before him. Your case is hopeless. But then when you appear before him, he announces that he has already settled your case. He has decided to punish not you, but his only son in your place. And as a result, you're released from the legal penalty demanded 
by your rebellion. That's what it means to be redeemed. But there's so much more. Because now this king is without a son, as the penalty for your law-breaking was death, and he has killed his only son in your place. And he could, in response to that, just, just release you, right? He could just send you back into the kingdom. He could tell you just, go and sin no more, and that would be far more than you deserve. But this king is not content merely to hope that you will become a law-abiding citizen. And so he ends your trial by declaring that he has adopted you into his family. You're no longer a criminal. You're no longer even a subject, a servant, a slave. No, you are now, legally speaking, a child of the king and the inheritance his only son deserved. It's been granted to you. That small and imperfect analogy, it it gives us a sense of what the Bible says has happened to us in Christ, where the Father sent forth his Son to redeem us and to adopt us into his family. What grace. But there's more. We haven't yet exhausted the riches of the Father's benevolence. The Father was not finished sending when he sent his son. He also sent his spirit. Look at verse six, he says, and because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. By the way, I hope you can see the skeleton of this passage, it's important. It reveals, it emphasizes the gracious work of the Father. Paul uses the same Greek verb twice. In verse four, he said, God sent forth his son. In verse six, the same Greek verb, God sent forth the spirit of his son. So Paul's emphasizing this kind of double-barreled sending, these two paralleled gifts of the Father. We've talked about what it means that God sent forth that son. What does it mean then to us that he sent forth the spirit of his son. Having redeemed us through the son, why does the father then also need to send the spirit? And this is the answer to that question that really reveals just how generous and gracious and kind our loving father is. The truth is, for many of us, we don't really have a problem understanding the reality of our adoption. Like some of you, as I was ticking through a minute ago, like the implications of the fact that God has adopted us into his family by sending his son. I was ticking through those things, and some of you were like, yep, I got it. I know that. I know that too. I know that too. Maybe I hadn't thought about that way, but that's something that I already understood, right? You, you were tracking with me. Many of us do. When we have a pretty firm grasp on the legal reality of our adoption as sons and daughters into God's family. What we fail to really hold on to is the living reality of the privilege of being God's adopted sons and daughters. In other words, these things that we know about our adoption, in truth, they just don't really impact the way we live our lives. They don't make the journey from our heads to our hearts and take root in our hearts in a way that that shapes our experience of our relationship with God. Right, the Father, he sent the spirit of his son so that we would not only have an understanding of our adoption, but so that we could have that experience of our adoption. He sent the spirit so that our adoption wouldn't just be this objective reality in our minds, but that it would be a dynamic and living and subjective reality in our hearts. He sent the spirit so that we would not merely know, but that we would also feel the glory of our adoption. Let me explain what I mean. Because no matter how many years you've been following Jesus, no matter how many years I've been following Jesus, and no matter how well our minds grasp the truths and implications of the gospel, every single one of us, we walk through life with with these orphan tendencies. 
we tend to function or operate like we're orphans rather than sons or daughters adopted into the father's family. What do these orphan tendencies look like? Well, spiritual orphans need to be right all the time. They're insecure. They're defensive. They don't handle criticism well because they aren't assured of the Father's love for them. They live with a a chip on their shoulders. Like they always have something to prove to themselves or to others. Spiritual orphans tend to be bitter. Maybe not all the time and maybe not at everyone, but there's some pockets of bitterness deep in their hearts. Spiritual orphans are critical of other people's. They generally are blind to their own sin, but they're experts on the sins and weaknesses of others. They tend to grumble and complain. Spiritual orphans, they they aren't focused on the eternal inheritance secured by their adoption. So when this life disappoints them, they feel like just everything is falling apart, like everything is crashing down on them. Spiritual orphans, they lack a daily and vital intimacy with God. They don't commune with God. They, they might very well believe in him, but they don't enjoy him. They lack the kind of relationship a child enjoys with a loving father. Spiritual orphans need to be in control. They need to look good in the eyes of others. Spiritual orphans are anxious about their health, about money, about friends, about their kids, about school, about work. Spiritual orphans, they struggle to trust things to God. They trust to really believe that God is a loving father who will provide for them and care for their needs. Spiritual orphans, they feel discouraged and defeated. Spiritual orphans live like they have to be at the center of everything. Everything is about them all the time. They need people to notice them. They need people to care about them. And they're uncomfortable when anyone else is the center of attention because they failed to grasp at a heart level the depth of the Father's love for them and sending forth his Son and sending forth his Spirit to bring them into his family. Now contrast all of that with the attitude of a son or a daughter. A son or a daughter who is secure in the love and affection of the father. A son feels free from worry because of God's love and care. A son feels forgiven and totally accepted by God. He doesn't really worry if other people accept him or not because he's secure in the fact that God has accepted him. A son is soft. He's teachable. Like he responds well to the correction and the input of others. He's not defensive because he knows that the father has his best interests at heart, even when his father disciplines him. And he's wise enough to recognize that sometimes the father disciplines him through the voices of other people who love him. A son looks to prayer as It's kind of a first resort when life gets challenging. And the son enjoys spending time with his father in in the word, in prayer, in gathered worship like this. A son is content. He knows that he has, by the grace of the father, far more than he could ever hope to deserve. And so a son doesn't fixate on what he lacks. He doesn't fixate on what he doesn't have. And said a son trusts that his father will meet his deepest needs because of what the father has already done to adopt him into his family. And so a son is satisfied. He has learned, in the words of the psalmist, he has learned to calm and quiet his soul in the presence of his loving father. Church, don't you want your life to resemble the life of a son 
or daughter of God? And frankly, doesn't the life of the orphan just sound exhausting? This is how kind the Father is, because he's sent his spirit into our hearts, not to give us the reality of sonship, we already have that. He sent his spirit into our hearts to give us the experience of sonship. Yes, the Father knows that we we drift toward these orphan tendencies, so he's put his spirit in our hearts to assure us again and again and again that we're adopted sons and daughters. He's put his spirit into our hearts to help us enjoy the experience of adopted sons and daughters. Notice what Paul says in verse 6 that the Spirit does in our hearts. I think this is incredible. I don't want you to miss it. Right, according to verse six, the Spirit is in our hearts crying out. So it's not you crying out. It's not your heart crying out. It's the Holy Spirit of the Son of God in your heart crying out on your behalf. And how does the Spirit cry? What does he say? He petitions the Father, calling him Abba, Father. And perhaps you've heard at some point in your life that that's like this term of endearment that essentially the Spirit is speaking to the Father and calling him Papa or calling him Dad or something like that. And that is absolutely true, but that's not the significant thing about this. The significant thing about this is the fact that there is one person who had the right to address God the Father in that way. And he did when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, bearing the weight of our sin, proceeding to the cross. He did as he hung on the cross, dying in our place. He cried out to God saying, Abba, Father. The Spirit has given us the same experience of intimacy and communion and fellowship that Jesus Christ had with God the Father. That is the wonderful news of this passage that you and I, we can connect with and commune with and relate to God the Father through God the Spirit in the same way that God the Son does, with the perfect and sweet and eternal intimacy that has existed in the Holy Trinity. That's the kind of relationship that we can enjoy with the Father who sent his son, and who sent his spirit. Do you feel that today? Do you feel the intimacy and the communion with the Father that is yours because of the gospel? Some of us don't, and we don't because we've never truly embraced the work of the Son in our lives. We've never recognized our need for a savior. We've never recognized the awful reality of our sin and we've never believed that we need a substitute to pay the just penalty of our sin and to satisfy the wrath of God against our sin. If that's you this morning, oh, I plead with you. Believe that in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman and born under the law to redeem you and to adopt you as his son or daughter. Others of us, we don't feel the privilege of our adoption because we need to invite the work of the Spirit increasingly into our lives. We need to ask the Spirit to help us feel what we may only know We need to ask the Spirit to help us taste what we may only see. We need to ask the Father again and again to pour out his love through his Spirit into our hearts so that we might cry out like Jesus did, Abba, Father. Do you know the privilege of being counted eternally as a son or daughter of God the Father? Do you feel the privilege of being counted eternally as an adopted son or daughter of God the Father? I pray that you do. Let's pray together.
Father, we ask this morning uh, that our minds would comprehend the wonder of our adoption. And we pray that your spirit would be sent into our hearts in such a way that we could feel and experience the wonder of our adoption. Lord, help us to see the ways in which uh, we, we function and live, not as sons and daughters, but still as spiritual orphans. Help us to, to turn from these things and help us to trust wholly and newly in your love for us. May we know what it means and may we delight in what it means to call you Father. Amen.